The year is 1957 and Contergan hits the West German market. Produced by Grundental, the same pharmaceutical company that brought penicillin into Germany post World War II after the Allied Control Council ban was lifted. Hailed as the silver bullet for insomnia and morning sickness, it was marketed in 46 countries by the mid 1950s. It was known by many names. Distaval in Australia and UK, Cabadon in Canada and USA. But behind all these names was one chemical. The active ingredient of Contergan is thalidomide, a drug synthesized in 1954 under the head researcher of Grunenthal, Heinrich Müller. The medication was initially marketed as a sedative due to its structural similarity to glutathione, brand name Doridin, a hypnotic drug produced by Siba in 1954 as an alternative to barbiturates. However, it was discontinued due to addiction and dependency. In addition to Contergan's sedative, properties, it was noted to have a positive effect in alleviating morning sickness in pregnant women, which coupled with its apparent lack of toxicity in rodents, was branded as safe, effective and unpoisonous. It was made available over the counter and physicians were encouraged to give free samples to pregnant women as it caused no harm to either mother or baby. With over 50 advertisements plastered in major medical journals, 200,000 letters to doctors around the world, 50,000 circulars to pharmacists, the marketing of this medication left no stone unturned. This resulted an estimated 90,000 packets of medication being sold per month during the first year. The road to changing the fortunes of Grunanda was in sight. The wind of what was to come began in 1958. Dr. Gustav Smalls from Frankfurt reported giddiness and unsteady balance when taken by the elderly at the recommended doses. This was very similar to an observation made by one of Grunenthal's testers, Dr. Young, back in 1955. However, Grunenthal reported it was the first time they had heard of any such issue with the medication. Two years into its global conquest and soaring profits, concerns about the safety of Contergan began to be raised. An initial warning was presented by a doctor in Koblenz, West Germany, who reported complaints by chemists of abnormally cold feet and hands when the medication was taken in March 1959. Then, another doctor from Koenigsegg reported side effects with it in April. In July of the same year, a not so friendly letter came from 20 Switzerland doctors speaking to Pharmacola AG representatives about reports of involuntary tremors and sickness, with some doctors giving personal accounts of how the medication had negatively impacted their own family members. Not so long after that, in October, an established neurologist from Dusseldorf, Dr. Ralph Voss, inquired about the possible nerve damaging effects of the medication to whom Grunantel categorically denied any such link. Following the response, Dr. Voss continued his investigations and concluded that the reported symptoms were much in keeping with peripheral neuritis and Contergan was the most likely culprit. Peripheral neuritis is an inflammation of the nerves outside the brain and the spinal cord. This inflammation causes damage to these nerves and depending on the ones affected, symptoms can range from tingling to numbness in the hand and feet to loss of balance and muscle weakness. Dr. Voss communicated his findings and was once again dismissed by Grunenthal. Other dog tests across West Germany had also noted similar symptoms and arrived at the same conclusion that Contergan was the common denominator. From the growing concerns of doctors, Internal memos show the company became rather worried about the possibility of the medication becoming a prescription only drug. This would have definitely affected their bottom line, as the medicine was responsible for about 50% of the company's revenue, so much so that it was referred to internally as the apple of our eye. An internal memo written by Mukter to a friend estimated that over 1 million people in West Germany alone were taking this medication every single day. The sales team made it clear that all was to be done to ensure it remained over the counter. In May of 1960 prevent any harm to the golden goose. Grunenthal unleashed its sales department on chemists, urging them to see the economic loss they would incur if the medication became prescription only. They doubled their efforts with the scientific community for the production of favorable reports with no care for the scientific method. That's a selective analysis of the data to support their claims and did anyone mention bribes. Not only that, they also applied their influence to delay the publications of doctors that highlighted the negative effect of the medication. A neurologist from Frankfurt who had shown concern about the medication in 1959 fell prey to this tactic when he refused to play ball. Dr. Killing, the liaison chief at the time, bragged about it in an annual report on how his connection with the then editor caused this coincidental delay. Around October of 1960, there was too much evidence suggesting Contergan could be causing polyneuritis. That internally, Mukter suggested some alteration in the advertisement of the drug, noting that people with a certain disposition could have a reaction that would stop once the medication was stopped. In fact, there were about 150 cases known to the company, but by May of 1961, 
this was around 1300. Internal documents indicate some executives were split on how to proceed, given the sorrow figures of peripheral neuritis, whether to go prescription or stay over the con. Files others saw the opportunity to show their business acumen by suggesting discounts to chemists that would buy counter gun in bulk as a preemptive action to cushion the falling cells that were to ensue. This impending storm had Dr. Voss, the neurologist, at its core. In February of 1961, he held a lecture where he described the symptoms of prolonged use of counter gun and the development of peripheral neuritis and did not mince his words when he told his colleagues that of the 14 cases he had investigated, not a single one had subsided after cessation of the medication. A memo from the clinical researcher at Grunantal showed that the writing was on the wall. June of 1961, Dr. Noel, a senior member of Grunenthal's political department, got a stern talking to by the health department as they believed his company had not been truthful regarding Contegan and its side effects. They had grounds to believe Dr. Voss had alerted the company in 1959 before Noel's supposed concern about the medication getting too popular over the counter and voluntary suggestion of it becoming a prescription only drug in May of 1961. Safe, effective, and non toxic. Tagline with which Thalidomide was advertised and its popularity with expectant mothers as a reliever of morning sickness was highly encouraged. The stillest, the company selling Thalidomide under the brand name of Distaval in the UK, had no qualms plastering this everywhere. The truth is, the medication had never been tested on pregnant women. In fact, Mukter had been asked this question by a sales representative from Finland in July of 1961, to which he responded it was not known if the medication crossed the placenta and that it was unlikely to harm the developing fetus. Not a single response of his was based on any evidence. Across the ocean to Sydney, Australia, Dr. McBride, an obstetrician studying miscarriages, began noticing a pattern of severely malformed babies in Crown Street Women's Hospital. In three weeks, he had seen two babies with very similar malformations, which will later be known as phocomelia, from Greek phoco, seal, and melos, limb. The condition is so rare that most doctors only knew it from books. Phocomelia syndrome is a rare birth defect characterized by severe malformation of the extremities, primarily the arms and legs. This leads to severely shortened or missing limbs, with fused fingers, toes giving a flipper-like appearance. In addition to the limbs, it can involve defects in the eyes, nose and ears. Looking through the notes of the mothers, he noted that they both lived close to the nuclear reactor and had taken thalidomide. This table, in the early stages of the pregnancy. Was this chance or could there be something to this? On June 8th, 1961, just over a month after the first baby, another child with the same malformation was born in the hospital and the common denominator in the three mothers was again discovered. Through the evidence he gathered, the medication was withdrawn from the hospital. He presented his findings to the pharmaceutical reps but they dismissed him and showed no interest in the matter, steadfastly adhering to the company line. However, they decided to send a letter of his findings to the parents' company in London. He also wrote to the medical journal Lancet regarding his concerns but this was not taken seriously initially till the end of the year. Back in Germany, around the same time Dr. McBride was doing his investigations, a pediatrician from Hamburg, Dr. Lenz's attention, was brought to the matter by a lawyer from a town near Münster whose family had been afflicted by the birth defects. In August, Dr. Lenz went to Münster and saw the opinions of his colleagues, Dr. Kesnau and Dagenhardt, had been aware of these malformations since 1960 due to reports from neighboring towns and had been investigating this themselves, but had been unable to find a likely cause. When Dr. Lenz returned to Hamburg following his visit, his investigations left him very little to be happy about. To his dismay, within the past 13 months, eight children with phocomelia had been identified in 6,220 births. To give you a perspective, from 1930 to 1955, of the over 200,000 newborns, only one had such a condition. As an 80 year old physician with a specific interest in malformations put it, before 1961, he had seen more conjoined twins than phocomelia, but this had now become an epidemic. With further investigations, speaking to more mothers and going through medical records, by November 15, 1961, a pattern began to emerge as Contergan was a common denominator in the 14 cases he followed. Unlike Dr. McBride, who had the reps to speak with in Australia and whose findings were yet to make it to the parent company in London, Dr. Lenz contacted Grunenthal and informed them specifically Mukter about his findings and the need for prompt withdrawal. Like they did Dr. Gustav in 1958 and Dr. Voss in 1959, the concerns of these medical experts were brushed under the carpet, not giving the care one would expect given the gravity of the matter. On the 16th of November, Dr. Lenz put his findings in a letter and sent it to Grunenthal. He then attended a pediatric convention in Dusseldorf where he discussed his suspicions of a drug being the culprit of the epidemic of malformations. In private, he disclosed that it was Contergan. This was 
followed by a meeting with Grunantel, legal advisors and representatives on the 20th of November together with the health authorities. Dr. Lenz presented his case and it was clear that Grunantel had an agenda. It was to put holes in Dr. Lenz's hypothesis and also threaten legal action. Another meeting took place on the 24th and Grunantel had no intention to withdraw the medication but proposed their willingness to add a sticker to the packaging contraindicating it for pregnant women. The health authorities made it clear to Grunantel either they do the withdrawal themselves or they would do it. Back at the headquarters, the reps communicated the ultimatum to Grunantel suggesting voluntary withdrawal of Contergan, but Mukter opposed it, stating he would take full responsibility whilst having in his hand Dr. Mike Bride's letter. On the 26th of November, the newspaper Belt Am Sontag published Dr. Lenz's position on the culprit of this epidemic of malformed children. Their source was present at the convention in Dusseldorf. The next day, Contergan was withdrawn from the market. In many countries, was thalidomide marketed one it so wanted was the USA. In September of 1960, Richardson Merrill Company sought approval from the FDA to market thalidomide under the brand name Keverdon in the USA. However, Dr. Kelsey, a pharmacologist, part of the reviewing team, stood in their way. She found the studies presented for approval to be wholly inadequate to support the medication safety and the doctors supporting it seemed to be giving advertising testimonials. Her background as a former editorial assistant for JAMA was handy. She rejected the application and demanded more data. In the meantime, she did some further research into thalidomide and came across a paper from the BMJ detailing its association with peripheral neuritis. This was known to Richardson Merrill but was was not listed as one of the side effects of the medication. When this was presented to them, they argued it was at least safer than the addictive barbiturates. Prior to commencing her role as a drug reviewer one month ago, she had worked with Dr. Galen at the University of Chicago during her doctorate to produce synthetic quinine, the anti-malarial drug, back in 1942. The experimentations were done with rabbits and Dr. Kelsey had realized at the time that pregnant rabbits had difficulty breaking down quinine compared to non-pregnant ones and that the developing embryos could not do it at all. She wondered what thalidomide could do to the pregnant woman and fetus if grown adults were having these adverse effects. Richardson Merrill kept pursuing the approval and Dr. Kelsey kept declining it until April 1962 when they withdrew the application. The link with birth defects was overwhelming. Before Contergan was withdrawn from the general market in 1961, it was estimated to have caused over 2,000 deaths and 10,000 malformed children worldwide. About 50% occurred in Germany. In 1956, a year before its eventual debut in the German market, free samples had already been given to doctors in potential markets across the world for distribution. In the USA, though the efforts of Dr. Kelsey prevented such tragedy, Charles Merrill had distributed around 2.5 million tablets to about 20,000 patients on an investigational basis. This resulted in the birth of 17 malformed babies. On 27th May 1968, six Karens and three ex-employees of Grunenthal, the mother company, were brought before the court in Germany. There were 400 co-plaintiffs with 952 pages of indictment, 70,000 pages of evidence and 351 witnesses against nine defendants. Sources could only compare it to the Nuremberg trial post-World War II. However, Grunenthal came prepared with 40 lawyers who had no issues employing the dark arts of their trade. It was revealed that prior to hitting the market, in 1955, one of the doctors hired by Grunantal, Dr. Piacenza, to test Contergan, then known internally as K-17, had reported the development of allergic reactions to the medication. Though it was brushed under the carpet by Mukter, he suspected this could be because of two reasons, either too high a dose or damage to the nerves. Furthermore, in 1958, to promote the use of their medication, they misquoted the work of a doctor who had used the medication in breastfeeding mothers and presented it as proof of its safety in pregnant women. The doctor stated categorically that he had never used the medication in pregnant women. This, however, did not prevent Grunenthal from sending this proof to over 40,000 family doctors, encouraging the medication as a solution to morning sickness. Not only that, they also ghost wrote articles bearing the names of doctors when they had no role in the paper in question. Remember Dr. Knowles from the political department Grunenthal. Internal documents indicate that he indeed had been kept in the dark about the side effects before 1960. His notes on the matter show how disappointed he was. Additionally, whilst talks about Contergan being the possible cause of the deformities were ongoing, Grunenthal was still advertising its medication as safe. Even when Mukter himself had told his colleagues that if he were a physician, he would not have prescribed Contergan. On 
the 18th of December 1970, the trial came to an abrupt end. All nine men, from Herman Ritz, the founder, to Mukter, the director of research and development, faced no conviction. Kronenthal was also granted immunity from future criminal prosecution on the matter. Archives from Germany show whilst court proceedings were taking place in 1969, Kronenthal was having private meetings with the Ministry of Health, unbeknownst to the plaintiffs, and that the individual controlling prosecution was part of the legal firm defending Grunenthal, specifically the founder, Mr. Hermann Ritz. Furthermore, this same individual, Dr. Neuberger, became the Minister of Justice in North Rhine-Westphalia, where the trial was taking place. The state prosecutor Joseph Harvitz recalls everything getting worse once Neuberger took over. In April of 1970, Grunenthal reached an out of court settlement with the victims. 100 million Deutsche Marks were paid into a foundation by Grunenthal, with the addition of another 320 million Deutsche Marks by the German government. In 2008, Grunenthal paid an additional 50 million euros. In the USA, Merrill also worked free, even though it had marketed an unapproved drug and made false claims about its safety. In the UK, distillers who distributed Thalidomide under the brand name of Distaval paid out 28 million pounds in compensation, then another 20 million in a trust in 1973. In Australia, following the out-of-court settlement of Row in July 2012, 89 million dollars was awarded to over 100 victims in December of 2012. After 50 years of silence, in 2012, Grunenthal apologized for the tragedy. Till date, they maintain no wrongdoing and believe they acted within the scientific and legal framework of the time. The original catastrophe maimed 20,000 babies and killed 80,000.